the macro situation at least seems to be somewhat clear, I would think, even if we don't necessarily have the Fed ready uh, to wave that white flag and say that they're done. Yeah, Romain, I just, I just wrote a piece, Opportunity in Every Difficulty, where I, I compared this market to the 1990s when I actually was alive and managing portfolios. And, you know, there's a lot of similarities. We had a war, we had a recession, which we've not yet had. We had higher interest rates and, and inflation. And yet the stock market was able to turn in during that decade S&P and Dow over 400% cumulative, and the Nasdaq over 800. I, I'm not always optimistic, um, and you know we were pretty pessimistic going into 2020 and put hedges on our clients' portfolios, not because we knew anything, mm -hmm. but because we couldn't find any attractive names. But we're still finding high-quality companies with attractive valuations, and I think you're right. The earnings narrative is going away. We'll be back to listening to Fed speak uh, and also. Uh, you know, sort of global macro issues and, of course, paying attention to well, the bond market. But I actually think we rally into the end of the year. And we, we said that at the end of October. And so far, that's that's been right. Uh, we'll probably get some, you know, volatility in the yeah. next couple of weeks. And then I think December will be pretty strong. And then we have to step back and just take a look at how, how slow the economy is going to become in yeah. 2024. Do, do you think, though, if we do rally into the end of the year, do you think that's going to be a bit of a broader rally this time, Nancy? I mean, we talk about earning C&P season being over, but we forget we still get a lot of those mid-cap and small-cap names over the next few weeks, and I'm wondering if they're going to provide any sort of upward catalyst for the market. I hope so. What I worry about with small caps is, you know, they're really dependent on floating rate debt. Uh, the large caps are not. I mean, even if you just look at technology, uh, that their debt servicing levels that are, are at historic lows, they, you know, they issued debt when we were in the zero interest rate environment, and they parked some of it on their balance sheet, and the rest they used to buy back shares. So their debt servicing has not gone up, and yet the small caps not only have that problem, but then they have the the zombie com company problem of companies that make up the Russell 2000 that have no earnings. So I, I hope we see certainly more broadening in the sectors, and I do hope that the mid caps and small caps contribute. I'm just not real willing to to chase the the bounce we've had in small cap yet, um, which may mean I miss it. But uh, that they've been historically unreliable as a sector or as a cap weighted class. Yeah, I'm just looking at the performance so far this year. You have the Russell 2000 off by one and a half percent when you include dividends, whereas everything else, especially the Nasdaq and the S&P, posting double digit increases. Um, I wonder, Nancy, we don't have any economic data really to speak of this week, significant data. So it's all about the Treasury issuance and Fed speak. Does Fed speak matter to you right now? Well, I, I tell you, the, I, Scarlett, the irony was not lost on me that Neil Kashkari started us off this week with, you know, a pretty hawkish stance. And this was a guy that was a permadove uh, during the entire easy money period. So I, I think, you know, historical track records matter. And so I try to, I, I just try to um, zone it out and, and not pay attention because the Fed is becoming less and less important as we get closer to the end of this regime. And I actually think, you know, the people that are breathlessly sort of repeating that, you know, we're going to stay higher for longer. I mean, th there are a lot of factors. Um, and, and if I could just add real quickly, I mean, one of the things about being in this business, you have to learn who to listen to. Mm -hmm. And when Brian Reynolds talks, mm -hmm. I listen. And he identified some serious increases in inventories that uh, he doesn't think work through the system until 2025. And that is going to to put a down downward pressure on inflation, which will relieve the pressure on the Fed. So I, I think you know, we, we have to be careful when we try to predict what they're going to do, because I don't think they know. Okay, yeah. I mean, they're taking as the data comes, so they're, they're working with the same information that we are. So if you're not listening to Fed speak the way that maybe we did a couple years ago, I'm wondering what you're hearing from the CEOs as we wrap up this earnings season. Uh, you've definitely great, uh, gained conviction around a couple of names that you've bet on and, and are increasingly feeling more confident about. What did you hear this earnings season from CEOs that, that really justify that conviction? Well, one is I think that the the AI phenomenon is real and it will be monetized. Um, the second thing is we we heard um, many of the higher quality companies improve their margins. We saw beat beat and raises out of many of the tech or some of the technology companies, not many. So. 
and, and then with a company like Starbucks, you have a new CEO who I think is going to be a memorable CEO. And he's been able to keep, you know, he, he's been able to step into Schultz's shoes and really deliver on the things he said he was going to deliver on. So I, I'm pretty optimistic about that person purchase. It's relatively recent for us. We've owned it in the past, but um, strong management teams get it done even in difficult economic environments.